controls the nature of our soul. Despite, despite our enlightenment, which insists to the contrary, humanity is not so far removed from our Christian roots, and we have never been so uh, we have never been much interested in truly objective explanations of the obvious. Instead, we as human beings have an imperative need to assimilate all outer outer sense experiences to an inner psychic event. It is not enough to see the sun rise and set. This external observation must be, must be at the same time a psychic happening. The sun in its course must represent the fate of a god or a hero. The sun rises and sets each day because the sun god was murdered in god time and then resurrected with the dawn. All the mythological processes of nature, such as summer and winter and the phases of the moon and rainy seasons and so forth, are in no sense allegories of these objective occurrences. Rather, they are expressions of the primordial, primordial, primordial drama, it was a long night, primordial <laughs> drama of mythology, which is mirrored in the events of nature. These sacred narratives do not explain the world, they are the source of the world. So for the purposes here, and then for the purposes of our, our, our setting, mythology is not something that explains a truly, a, you know, an outside correct objective. It's really the source of the out, outside objective. <coughs> Can I yes. kind of jump in with an editorial, very simple uh, explanation? Um, history and science explain the how and, um, you know, like, how we came to be here, but mythology explains why we are here and where we are going you know, if, if it goes that far forward. And so that's why, for example, Miranda being a, a mythologically resonant world, a world that is ruled more by, um, though it is indeed shaped by and propelled by its history, ultimately the mythology is what drives Miranda, like the mythic needs behind everything. If I am not just talking when you're talking about mythology, crazy talk and mythology have a wonderful overlap in the Venn diagram, almost an eclipse. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get outside? Yeah. And then the, the, the kind of next thing to define is what is cult. And again, uh, the cult is often, it's a, usually used as a pejorative, but for our purposes, a, a cult is how do we, or usually in this case, how do our player characters interact with the world of the myth? They interact with it through cult. And you know, one of the interesting things about the word cult is it's the source of our word culture. And, it, it, and uh, how we interact or how our characters interact with what their mythology is really defines who they are in the world. And it actually, it might be a better one to throw in in a Pendragon context. <clears throat> well, yeah, I mean, so Pendragon is Pendragon is um, maybe unique in the Chaosian stable of games in that it really emphasizes um, <coughs> real world religious beliefs. So your characters are Christian, or they are pagan, or you know, one of a number of other real world religions, and um, you know, within the context of this discussion, we would call back a cult with as much as uh, Ernaldo or Orlando or, or what have you. It matters, uh, you know, where your climate is in that world, and that shapes your view of the world. Uh, yeah. I, and then I wanted to throw in two more things, some important facts whenever we talk about this, is that, that myths in any setting or any religion only make sense within uh within themselves so if we're familiar you know with uh with arthurian stories arthur can be in can be in stories both of which are true and part of canon that have been doing things that it is not possible for the same person to be doing at the same time that's perfectly permissible in there same thing in Miranda, you know, the, the god of Orland can be over doing something, fighting against dragons in one story. He can have an equally valid um, story where he had been imprisoned by that same dragon that he defeats and is rescued by somebody else. There's not a hidden 
uh, way to interpret well, what is the real story underly uh, underlying it. The real story in this are the stories. Can I just make a, uh, you mentioned Call of Cthulhu earlier, and um, I think that in a weird way, Cthulhu has what is the anti yes. origin in that all of the myths and the beliefs of the world are in fact utterly irrelevant, irrelevant and they are just minor delusions or pablum to keep humanity occupied while the cold, pitiless reality of the mythos works behind the scenes and is ultimately, you know, everything that humans have ever thought of as having meaning is meaningless. And so, yeah, and that's the myth of truth of the, the, yeah, the mythos. Uh, it's all your myths, they belong to us. And, <laughs> and it's my cult is when you're uh, over it. We're not taking questions yet, but I will allow it. <laughs> uh, just an observation uh, for the depth on the Lanthan mythology is that one of the really interesting features is that we, as you know, contemporary Lanthans have myths that we reenact now. Our heroes have myths they reenact today now. The gods who did those myths for the first time were sometimes reenacting things that were previously done by great cosmic entities to gain power. It is turtles all the way down. It is turtles all the way down. That's how that, you know, the, the, in a lot of, a lot of our work world settings, uh, and we were actually just having a great talk about this with the uh, Arthurian myth mm -hmm. earlier, and its resonance with earlier myths, and, and you can read the stories of Arthur as Arthur's, Arthur's stories are an echo of earlier stories, which are an echo of earlier stories. That's, that's how we, re we, we repeat things and gain, and we talk about gain power, and right, when I talk about repeating things to gain power, it's not like they I get this cool spell as a result of repeating things. It's that we're reinforcing our myths about how the world functions. And so we're, we're basically upholding the cosmos when we reenact, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally, we re reenact the myths that define the cosmos. Well, and I mean, to, to bring a game mechanic into it, it's almost as if by reinforcing the world's cultural tropes or the cultural pillars that hold the world, you've just exercised a skill or strengthened yourself in a certain way. And in game mechanics, just like in the ERP system, or you know, a successful use of a skill merits a chance for improvement. You gain a particular a new power, a new ability, a new way to manipulate the world because you understand something new about the world, having vicariously you know, explore the entire realm. Uh, yeah, but it's getting a little bit. Oh, I'm tired. a little tongue tied. It's been a long convention so far. But so I'm going to get to the last thing that I just want to put forward, and then we're just going to ramble off in many directions. But there, there are, and this starts setting up uh, us up for gaming. So there's four ways to experience myth. And I don't mean this from a player character point of view. I mean this as a personal for all of us. Because we all, no matter how enlightened or, or modern or objective we think we are, we all deal with the world mostly on mythological terms. Our mythology may be very different. Our, uh, our, our, we have all sorts of secular mythologies in, in every society. Uh, as well as religious societies. This, it, this is the framework by which we try to understand how the, the, the universe works. There are four ways to experience myth, and I'm gonna go from it from the absolute worst to the absolute best. The absolute worst way to understand mythology is to read it. Reading, think about it like, like a play. The absolute worst way to experience Shakespeare's Henry V is to sit down and silently read the play. You'll, you'll get some of it, but you won't get much of that experience. The next best way, a, a better way, it's not a great way, but it's certainly better than uh, just sitting there reading a book, is to have somebody else read you the story. And when it's somebody else other than you that's reading the story or reading the myth, there's inflection, there's enhancements, there's almost always an element of storytelling that starts creeping into it because it's the storytelling process 
It starts making this magical. And then the, a better way than having somebody else read this is to actually witness the myth being performed. So this is like watching a, watching a play, watching a television series, um, watching um, a, a religious procession. That's a way better way of dealing with, with myth than, than reading or even having somebody tell it to you. The, 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 I know where you go. The best way to interact with mythology is to participate in it. And that's what gets us into role-playing games, is that in role-playing, it's an opportunity for us to actively participate in the stories that we make. And, and so that's kind of setting the framework for this discussion. Um, I just, you know, as a, a parallel thing, like quite recently, for no apparent reason, I was like inhabited briefly by the spirit of Walt Whitman, and I went and bought a copy of uh, Song of Myself, and I was reading it at home and thinking, uh, I can't remember why this like jumped out at me, and then I just, on a whim, started reading out loud, and it was like like lightning again, and I'm like, oh yes, this is how you read Walt Whitman experience that glorious epic, utterly bonkers poem is to actually like voice it and let it flow through you. And in a way, you know, I'm not saying everything all that we do is poetry, but you know, from almost any role-playing experience, we're sort of channeling this uh, this heroic narrative or in unheroic or dastardly narrative or humorous narrative, but we're sort of getting in these spirits that are out there in the uh, the ether and bringing them through ourselves. I mean, every time we play Call of Cthulhu, we, at a certain level, this is a reenactment of the Gigantron, the, 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 the fight against sure. the fight against the forces of chaos and the void that threatened to destroy the universe. Well, our little characters, when we go through this, we're being able to participate in this um, in this story and. It's a powerful story. It still has tremendous resonance to us. And, you know, in our normal life, we probably don't spend a lot of time fighting against the monsters of chaos. But role playing games gives us a way to participate in these powerful stories, experience it, and of course, they always come out infinitely richer than if I sit there and I read Hesiod's dry little description of it. So, with that, I know Nick had a question. Or you already asked it. He already asked it. I already asked it. You asked it. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, as I was in the how 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 can they deal with the story of it? I mean, when some when the player I was playing from another table, no. So, for example, if I mention the three, they will come to that. Oh, I can do. And if I mention like fire, oh, they do that. And and if I mention like the birds. Now, like, yeah, oh, I, yeah, no, it's, like story, it's an over, and this is a part, this is a, this is a, a game mastering technique. It, one of the concerns, and, and, and this is a big concern in a lot of um, how Cthulhu scenario is written in the 1980s, is it's a certain bit, oh, you know, you've mentioned this, we start having these signs of this figure. My, my, well, I know exactly what this had, what this does. We know how to overcome it. Blah 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 blah. How would you? How do you deal with that one, Jason? Um, well, I, I don't run a lot of Call of Cthulhu. That's one way that I. I, 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 I very dearly. In fact, it was a game that I played before, pretty much. Um, but. Uh, no, I mean, when I'm doing that, I want to both um, try and conceal the clues, maybe obfuscate the world, because it's not so easy to find. But on the other hand, I've got to say, sometimes we have to recognize that we're sort of playing these hero epic narratives, and that we understand that if you're playing, you know, if you're playing Call of Cthulhu, and you start finding out that people are disappearing near the ocean, and there are weird scaly footprints, there's a certain thrill uh, of the frisson when you go, oh, I know what we're in for here. And maybe it will diverge, but maybe it won't. Maybe it will be a thrill ride that takes you exactly where you expect it to go. And I mean, I, I think that there's a certain power to that because everyone's 
they're, they're already experienced. You know, they've had this experience, they've seen these stories, they've maybe even played them before. And in fact, sometimes they, uh, you could actually gain more appreciation for having played them uh, further. It's just like, for example, a, a rival company, I, I dare name their product, but uh, the Aliens role-playing game. I mean, it says Aliens on the box, so it's on the character sheet. If you are playing a game and it's like you're a bunch of colonial marines and you're sent to a place to do some stuff, it's just a problem with a bunch of colonists. Don't worry about it. I think everyone <laughs> knows what's going to happen. I think the ultimate program you see would be, it's a bunch of colonists. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, it's, that, you know, it's that crazy old real estate tycoon. <laughs> Outside of the player control. There are things that are going to be going on in this setting, and the setting will change, and that is not something that is likely within the ambit of the player's control. Uh, at a certain point, Arthur and Mugrid will um, end up fighting with each other. You know, and you always get people on, particularly in the online environment, uh, who say, well, you know, I feel very disempowered from this because I I think I should be able to, I am very upset about there being a meta plot. But as David said, well, there's a difference between having read a chronology. That is an altogether different experience from actually participating in these ongoing events. So I, I, I analogize it to if I was playing a game, doing a role playing game set in the late Civil War, well, by God, of course Caesar's going to get assassinated in the march, uh, the, the Ides of March, or, or the Roman, <laughs> the Roman Civil War. <laughs> of course Caesar's going to get assassinated in the Ides of March. It wouldn't be the Roman Civil War if that doesn't happen to Caesar. That's, that, that's a big event. And if the, the, the players might go, well, you know, this is, this is kind of boring. I, you know, I know that this is going to happen. You might know that this is going to be happening as a as a player, but you've never experienced this and participated in this, and suddenly you realize there is no way I could have stopped this thing. It, you know, this is going to happen. This was going to happen. And, oh my God! They, everything's way worse than I could possibly imagine it being. And oh Jesus! This ah, you know, it, it, even if I know that this is coming down the track. That it, I'm still having a novel experience of participating in it. It seems like you're getting dangerously close to suggesting that history is falling apart. Oh, history is absolutely falling apart. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who, who, you know, goes to the, the carnival and looks at a, uh, you know, a roller coaster ride and says, well, I can see where that goes. Oh, yeah, there's <laughs> And it just ends up right back here. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's like, you know, we, 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 you know, people that have been following the Game of Thrones novels, yeah. you know, I, we, we can tell what the end is. I'll, I'll tell you, eventually the Civil War ends, and eventually somebody becomes the king, and he or she is probably a jackass. Right? We, we, we know that. It, but look what happens. Look what happens. That's. But what we're interested in is in the story of these characters as they participate. It's actually a pretty predictable historical event. And if you've read your, your, uh, your War of the Roses, it becomes even more predictable. That doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, I mean, who goes to see Rocky Horror Picture Show like, and doesn't know how it all ends up? You know? And yet people do that nightly. And there's a whole cult of repeat viewing. Yes. Yeah, I, 
So I don't know if that helped at all. It certainly had us wander off in different directions. Does anybody else want to throw out at something? Or a question? Or a question? Yes. Um, can, you have, can you say something about how this uh, process of participation in MIT creates the community, both among gamers and also historically? Well, we've all participated whenever. And this is one of the great things about gaming is, first off, you and your group of players, when you participate in a story, all of you experience that story. All of you have these strong emotional uh, experiences from having done this, right? And that builds a degree of community. What's really remarkable is when many, many, many of us have participated in what is the same story, and yet have all had radically different experiences and different results from that same, the same story. Exactly. Right. There's what like, Greg had this great little uh, snippet of a story. Who all are, are familiar with the old RuneQuest uh, Ballastar's Barracks? The old RuneQuest scenario. Okay, so in that scenario, it was a uh, it was one of the early Chaos Deep scenarios. You go down in this underground uh, underground ruin on a hunt for a magic axe, and whoever has this magic axe has a claim on being the champion of Palace. This city. And in Greg's little story, one day Argraf, who has made himself king of Pavis, calls for the champion of Pavis, and a dozen people showed up. And all, they were all different. One was a troll, one was a woman, one was a man, one was a dwarf, one was a, a lunar, one was a, was a, 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 a stormbolt cultist, etc. And they all had gone into the barracks and brought back the, uh, uh, brought back the axe. And, and in a little story, Argrek brings in his soothsayers and they, they, they ask the gods, you know, who's lying of this? And the gods say, well, they all did it. And it's an analogy, it's basically a story about how we all are as gamers. Hundreds and hundreds of people have gone into Ballastar's barracks and they've all brought back the axe. And, and that's part of the reason that we are, uh, the, you know, the chaos you turn into, we are all the tribe. Because we've all had these uh, some set of these common experiences in game. Just as a clarifying question, was it all the same axe, or was it an axe that was unique to them? Well, it was an early RP2 scenario, so it all had the same. It one thing for it might be eight plus three damage. You had to follow the spells. Oh, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it seems, I think it also speaks to the myths only making sense within the spells. That's why prior to actual play of the streaming common wisdom was you can't explain a role playing game to somebody who has stuff because and, and a big part of that is because when you participate in a role playing game session with a, with a group you create your own language you create your own re points of reference even if it's the same scenario um, and yeah I mean people's experiences might vary wildly and yet it's the you know, same scenario so um, yeah, I think there's it, it's it's an individualized experience within a larger uh, commonality. I mean, just as an odd thing, I was um, at one point when I was writing the introduction for the RuneQuest starter set. It seems like there's this this universal or er, this is what role playing is document that's out there that everybody seems to be just transcribing. And I looked at it. Um, it's uh, circulated in the industry for quite a while. Um, this is the one that. Um, What's his name? Uh, it, or, and I won't identify it. But it said, role playing games are like participatory radio theater. Mm -hmm. But it's not all spinning. I don't know that. No, no, no. Well, that's okay. Yeah, it was sure. transcribing him. But I thought, okay, let's imagine this is a modern audience. How many people in this audience have actually witnessed or listened to participatory improvisational radio theater? Oh, who was always going to listen to radio theater? <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's a definite generational thing where I was like, why can't a role playing game just be like getting together and making up a story together with a few rules and a few guidelines? Right. It's just funny that, like you say, you can tell people about role playing, but really you're, you know, the cliche phrase is dancing by architecture. And, really and, and, and that, that goes for, you know, luminous experience of the whole time. You know, it's like you can hear about a revival dance or something, but unless you're in it for a long time, you're, 
And every time, I mean, this, it, it's a very fair point. Every time we role play out a scenario or, or sandbox something or whatever, what we end up with is a story created by everybody at that table. And even if that story is based on a written scenario that a thousand or five thousand other people have read and have run themselves, every one of your stories is going to be somewhat different than everybody else's stories and equally as correct as every other one and that's it, very close to how mythology works i mean the, 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 a, a, a good myth has many different versions it's only when those damn scribes start writing the thing down and saying this is the proper ready version yeah, that, that, that we start having the, the desire that there should be only one written expression of the story. And, and if I could get a little bit of uh, Oh, go the, there. Go there. I, I mentioned streams, actual plays. This brings the participatory myth to witnesses. So yes. we have two levels. And possibly even formation of cults in the sense of this Twitch stream has 500,000 followers or whatever. Is that a cult? Does witnessing mythology in action? Well, the players there, so let, let's let's run with the analogy. The players there on these these um, actual play, they are participating in participating in, in, in the myth and the story. Other folk are witnessing it. Yeah. And so clearly that's a cult yeah. for all the witnesses. Yeah. And hence the reason we have the arguments about which actual play is better. Right. Um, you know, just a weird digression, which is all I'm going to offer. Weird digression. Um, a long time ago, I got into a, I thought it was a fairly profound discussion. There was a point involved. But they, uh, about like our role playing games apart. And that could be practically a topic all on its own. And at the time, I said, I think that the making of a role playing game, you know, the filling of a book with pieces of art and fiction and narrative, I said, that can be art. The artifact of a role playing game is art. And at that time, though, I said, I do not feel that the playing of a role-playing game is art because it doesn't offer anything to anyone else that's not immediately participating in it. You were and, wrong. And then <laughs> we have the internet where, you know, we are beset by um, groups who are streaming and who are um, doing, like, live play videos and there are table reads of role-playing games and live action, you know, events where people are actually role-playing with, you know, auditoriums full of people. It was... This was actually just getting some steam before uh, you know, the dark times came upon us. And now I'm like, I, I'm wiping the scales from my eyes. I was wrong. And it is very much in like a, uh, an art form and thriving and new and uniquely um, uh, unique to our particular tribe of human beings. Oh, I, 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 I think that playing a role playing game is probably the most profound artistic interaction that, that we do. And the reason is, is that very few of us regularly get to be in a, 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 a position where we're making art. We're making something together. And even less rarely do we get to make an art collectively with a, a group of folk and experience it. Normally, we're passive receivers of stuff that other people have presented for us. And it's like, oh my god, you know, that's a, that's a really magnificent painting. But I'm watching it. I didn't make it. I didn't participate in it. I'm just witnessing it. Or I watch a, you know, I watch a cool series or or a movie. I'm a passive participant in it. But when we are role playing, we are moving one stage up. We are we are all creators yep. in that. Just as much as you know, some some jazz musicians playing together, yep. just jamming, They're creating a new thing that doesn't exist. They're not looking notes so or maybe someone is you know keeping the pace and keeping the tempo or using a popular riff but ultimately they're creating something new and original and that is where i say they don't need an audience for that they can do that themselves so maybe this is a transitory piece of art just a you know brief flicker of art that comes into the world in any way and in two of our games in moon quest and pentagon we 
it's a turtles all the way down bit here where we as players, the limit which we as players are reenacting an activity and reenacting a myth uh, and, and, and creating something new. That are, and then we go down to the next level and it's our player characters are reenacting a myth, uh, creating something new, creating a new, uh, a new myth based on something that we've heard that the characters or the players may have heard in the game uh, that goes another layer down. And, and that's, to me, that's one of the reasons that RuneQuest and Pendragon pose just infinite interest. Because it, it, there's a, a self-awareness of what's going on right, right, right. in that process with both of them. Yeah, and not only are you playing a real character, there's an aspirational aspect to that. You're sort of embodying a character that may be of the best you or just may be an interesting personality or creation that embodies something that you want to experience. Um, your character is also aware that there are these archetypes of personality and experience in the world that they want to embody mm -hmm. and, you know, turn this all the way up. So it can be... It's, there's a lot of troubles. Whereas, you know, the, the opposite, I would say, is true for Call of Cthulhu in that there's, you know, love Call of Cthulhu, but there's almost nothing aspirational about playing a Call of Cthulhu. Well, oh, yeah. it's survival and sanity. Mm -hmm. like, the aspiration of the, 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 the norm mm -hmm. is, like, I just want things to be normal again. Yeah. It's the aspiration of a Call of Cthulhu character. Like, please let it just go back to the way it was before the things got dark. Wouldn't the aspiration of Call of Cthulhu be the thing you acknowledge? Oh, what was that? Wouldn't the aspiration the more you yes. learn to call it Cthulhu, well, the worse you're in. And that's what I'm saying. That's the thing is the aspiration is the downfall. Exactly. Yes. 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 Uh, but as Jason said, the aspirational element is the is villainy. Yes. Or ignor yeah. ignorance and um, ignorance is bliss in Cthulhu. Yeah. So, I mean, your aspiration is I wish I didn't know what I know now. Yeah. My my revelation is in fact my doom. Yeah. So the the it, it, few years back. Uh, Jason and I were at a uh, uh, convention in southern France oh, yeah. where we had an interesting discussion along these lines. And wine was involved. <laughs> wine, it's <laughs> cold <laughs> um, But the, uh, we, we, we kind of posited that there's RuneQuest, Pendragon, and Cthulhu are opposite ends of the same scale. So in, in, in both RuneQuest and Pendragon, we imagine that, that our character, that the world is a dangerous place, chaos threatens this, but there are paths by which we can beat back the chaos and reimpose cosmic structure. You know, and this could be the, 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 the whole twilight period of, of the Grand Pendragon campaign is all about the, the, the walls are beginning to fall in, now it's your heroic chance to once, once more push things back. Maybe things won't be as good as they were, but the chaos won't come in and devour us all. Yeah. RuneQuest, same thing. Yeah. But in Call of Cthulhu, it is mathematically simply a matter of time. Okay, the bubble didn't pop this time, but sooner or later, the tiny, fragile, soaked bubble of, of sanity in an uncaring cosmic uh, orb, it'll eventually pop, pop and you know, humanity will be obliterated. It, it's, the way we, we, we um, characterize it is, is in, in RuneQuest, RuneQuest and Pendragon, we have our hopes. And we are we're basically fighting uh, at a certain point to, to bring hope at one level into the world. And with Cthulhu, the Cthulhu cosmology is how we really fear that the universe might really be. That the, that the universe is basically doesn't care about the human psyche or, or, or its position. And so, but they're on the same scale. They're both, uh, uh, what the, Conflict of the war against chaos. Mm. It's just that in Cthulhu, sooner or later, chaos will win. Yes, sir. So, will we know uh, Cthulhu at this point is higher than our king? We will tend to dominate. So, I think I will go. I hear what you're saying, right? I'm sorry. 
So was your proposal received in point is higher than our plan? Yes, that's not a very good thing to do. Yeah, and I think all the things that do will be on the top of the view, honestly, and then we will continue to change from the other one up on the seven major proposals. Um, I, I'm not entirely sure I'm quite getting the, there's a lot of background sound in here. Uh, can any, is anybody better able to think, are you better able to hear the question? Anybody else want that? Uh, it seems to be a lot of technical aspects of code between the seven division sound team and the other three micro scale is higher than your sound team. I uh, haven't let my player get to that point and therefore I have no experience in using those tools. I'm not nice. <laughs> yeah, my player has experience in that part of the view room and I thought the answer would that be helpful. Like one of my players made that situation, and then he got, and then he got confused like that because he don't know how to show that kind of idea. Like, and in the paper book it says when your kazoo is higher than your the 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 you will not the paper understand to this stuff. Sure. Right. So you crossed a, it's, you, you're over the tipping point yeah, of form of illumination. Yeah, if there's a, well, yes. I mean, the thing about <laughs> it, it's, it's funny, it's, I might make a mild disagreement here in that, um, you know, there is a uh, RuneQuest and, and Greg and R about fighting back this new chaos um, to restore order and normalcy to the world. Whereas Call of Cthulhu is ultimately, you are trying to maintain the illusion of order in the world, when in fact it's all chaos, it's all uncaring darkness, and this, uh, you know, the natural order of the universe is that humankind is a brief flicker of light and a, a cosmic, you know, just sort of an experiment by a bunch of plant aliens who happen to just release their test subjects into the world. And so everything about humanity, all of our meaning, all of our art, all of our culture, our songs, our dances, all of that is just, you know, it's just random static in the overall darkness of the universe. And Pendragon, oh, fire. Pendragon is about attempting to establish uh, a, a feeling of normality on, right. a, on a world of chaos. So yeah. it's a little bit in between. Yeah, those there's, two. There's, yeah. It's not all, you know, night and day, yeah. light and dark, finery. But it's a you know it's an interesting thing. But ultimately, the more you scrape at the surface of the universe, and yeah. In Call of Cthulhu, the more you just the universe peels away. Yeah. And it becomes like your character, the, the character uh, in question. Your when the more certain point in Cthulhu is your mythos lore goes up too high, it goes up to a certain point. Your sanity is never. It's just gonna always be under that. Right? So, for example, for your character or your your the player in your group whose character is like that. They have now realized that everything they believe is just a, it's a joke. And so they are probably going to have a very hard time of accepting much of reality. They can function for a while, but they're they on They understand the, the real yeah. reality. They're on the downhill slide, and it's it's only going to get worse. So, so that's my question, like, how do you, how do you show that kind of idea? Well, if you're the game master, you, give them special insights. Right. You, you know, characterize yeah. things according to the way they see the universe. Mm -hmm. As a player, you know, it can be difficult. I mean, you know, they're they're functionally crazy. Nothing means anything anymore. Um, and I, I guess that's what I, I apologize for the term, but in the Call of Cthulhu mindset, they're not sane at that point. They are clearly having a hard time. And so uh, they would characterize the universe and see it as a very, very threatening and very unpleasant place. We we got to lose it. It's an optional rule called being mythos card in play. So I want to go down and go to my mythos card and make that oh, uh, optional rule. So you're playing with that to decide to have value in your game. Sounds like an awesome optional rule. So circling back to the quest, I run for new players that don't actually play RPGs that often, mm -hmm. and this is you talk about participation, and it's very empowering if you kind of understand the the myth. But when running for people who aren't lore masters, who aren't history majors, who aren't interested in reading 10 books, um, how do you use the breadth of myth to empower? Because it can very easily belittle and make players feel small. And one of, one of the things I often do when, so I'm, I'll be running later on, I'll be running a, 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 a play test with the Zero Questing roles for request for whoever's 
the direction of Christ. And uh, one of the things that was really important to me for me on a design level is to absolutely avoid the requirement that people have a, a background in mythology um, or, or even worse, require that they have a, a PhD in Florentology uh, <laughs> in order to play a game. And so one of the things that I do is I tend to strip names down to, if, if we're talking about things, I tend to strip names <laughs> down to the, the adjective plus noun for what that, that thing is. So rather than talk about, you know, we're going on a, we, we, you know, this is the cult of Orland Thunderous and blah, 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 blah. This is the storm god. Uh, the, the, the storm god cult. And the reason is, is the people that are new, they might not, you know, if you say, well, this is a, this is clearly a counterpart to uh, uh, Indra uh, or Tamaris or the Indo-European storm god, it's not true, it's all awesome. But nobody knows that. I mean, uh, but if you say this is the storm god, and the storm god you know, the storm god is a farmer and a thunderer and made himself king of the gods. Pretty much what most people will get that. And so you boy with down, and, and to be honest, that's actually more immersive than, than throwing a whole bunch of fantasy names. Because first off, you're trying to juggle all these names in and, and, and that breaks the immersion because they're, they're they are, they all have deep meaning, et cetera, et cetera. But honestly, in a game, it's hard to keep these things, tra uh, 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 keep track of these things. So you, you boil it down to what is the actual archetype that you're going in. And I do the same thing with Pendragon. You know, Green Knight. Hey, it's the knight with two swords instead of, and, and because people can follow that, and when we give these titles, there's magic. There's actually more magic calling something, you know, the great thunder god than calling it Orlane Thunderous. You lose magic by giving it a... Um, it's, it's the folktale level. So there's folk tales, then legends, then sacred myths. If you start with the sacred myths, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. You start with the folk tale, and then let them move up. They, if they're more, if they want to know, like to learn more about Orland. <laughs> <laughs> they can move up to the legend, and then if they're really into it, if they're an, you know a, a priest of their cult, then then you can get into the and mysteries. It, and you know. once the players, you know, with new players, there is a certain joy and fun of having mastered the the, the terminology and the names yeah. to be able to know the difference between. Uh, great Cthulhu and Hostor, the unnameable. You know, there's, 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 people derive joy and pleasure from that, but don't start people that haven't gotten, uh, you know, aren't familiar with the setting. Try to boil it down uh, to what is the archetype. So Cthulhu becomes really easy, you know, it's, 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 uh, what is Cthulhu? Well, there's this horrible dead dreamer who one day will return again that lives beneath the ocean. And, uh, and when, he, when he's dead right now, but he still dreams, and when he awakens, we're all gonna go mad and die. Uh, you know, and that, if, if I've never heard of a Lovecraft story, something like that is something I can still grasp. And, but if I say to new players a fantasy name or a, uh, or a fictional name like that, you know, you're creating a barrier for them to be able to get to that point where they're able to then play around with with names and and, and different uh, deeper complexity. Yeah, I love that you named the like the time of the god, the sister god time, the only god. <laughs> yeah, my players really appreciate that. Oh, it's the god time. I get it. <laughs> yes. Can you talk more about how you then kind of created? So with with let me take a lead and you guys will jump with that. So the primary person that put together the mythos of Glorantha and Pendragon was Greg Stafford. So um, and Greg 
think this was a lifelong, the Greys have a lifelong interest in, in mythology um, and worked on it for many, 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 many years. And then um, at some point with Garantha, I, you know, Nick's worked with, with Greg before on it. I worked with, uh, with Greg for many years on this. And part of it was kind of getting, what is, what is really the story of this cosmology behind it? Let's not worry so much about <coughs> names and details and all that. That actually is deceptive to be able to write on it. It's trying to get, what are the really, what are the themes of these stories? What are the archetypes that show up over and over again in stories? And the same thing is true of Pendragon. It's, it's the, what is the underlying set of stories that Greg was wanting to gather together? What are the themes? And now we can throw in loads of additional details and subplots and whatever. Yeah, I mean, for um, a game that uh, none of you have actually read right now, I can almost guarantee it, Lords of the Middle Sea, one of our newer titles in development, it's a post-apocalyptic setting um, several hundred years after a uh, great flooding that destroys much of North America. There's like a continental ship that drops part of North America to the point where the U.S. is basically a series of large island land masses around a couple of great central seas. And it's full of sort of um, airships and adventure and a rebirth of uh, society. But for the religions of that, we decided to, to kind of have some fun with that. Some of them were hinted at in the very oldest uh, war game rules, but those were basically like a 16 page war game rules with probably no more than a, like a thousand pages of text about the setting. So we decided like what sort of religions would emerge and how does a religion flourish after it has been, you know, after the apocalypse has definitely come and you have survived the apocalypse. And so most of the documents you have and the memories of the, um, the old religions are, have been washed away because everybody had to seek the highlands and climb to the mountaintops so they wouldn't drown. And so people are, you know, there's a lot of people going in and finding old records and trying to resurrect these old religions and taking them into account that they're going to manipulate them for reasons of their own they're going to misunderstand them for reasons that are lost to us, and they're also going to um, sort of combine them to make them more appealing to uh, different uh, groups. And so the religions that um, inhabit the world of Lords of the Middle Sea are really kind of uh, an interesting and uh, sometimes humorous look at modern religions as interpreted by, yeah, there was an apocalypse, you know, 400 or so years ago, and here we are. So how do we deal with that, and what do we do next? This and this gets to actually one thing I dropped off on the early presentation, but I think it's the appropriate fit is um, in the cults book that's coming out for for RuneQuest. One of the get sections is um, guidelines for writing cults. Yeah. And and the question in there is every cult and by cult is it would. Um, you know, it can include religions, it can include ideological movements, etc. We're just using the, using the cult word cult as shorthand. Everyone deals with basically five concepts. It's got to be there in it for it to be able to work. And, you know, some, for some it's more important than for others, but these are five commonalities. One is the cult provides a means for us to reconcile with ourselves, right? It explains why, you know, how it is, I don't feel good, or maybe I feel like a failure or whatever. It allows us to reconcile that feeling with, you know, well, our cult. It, it gives you sort of a measuring stick by which you can judge, I am flawed, yeah. I, am, I, am I am not flawed, I am I am well. It gives us a measuring stick for ourselves. Yeah. It also gives us a, a measuring stick for how we interact with, with greater society. A greater society, we can say, well, we interact with greater society because the greater society is of the elect and it all follows the rules. Or it could be we withdraw from greater society because greater society is, is hopelessly corrupt and wrong. Right. Um, it gives us a way to reconcile with the, with the cosmos. How, why, and, and by that it is, 
What is my place in the universe? Why are there people? Why am I here? Um, and, and the other one, and this is the always the weirdest one in any, any cult, is there is what Greg called the great mystery. It, human beings, there are certain things that we accept that are important and we can't, are not capable of knowing them. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein, the, uh, uh, the Austrian-English uh, writer, uh, wrote, the, uh, wrote a text basically saying that logical philosophy is totally irrelevant. It's nothing but a set of word games, and we can define things in the, basically when you play a word game to a logical bit, it's a statement that either is a statement we can make, or it's a nonsense statement. And the conclusion of it is, is that all the important things about being a human being fall into the latter category of nonsense statements. They just, they, they don't mean anything logically, but they're the only important questions. And every cult provides us a way of how do we deal with the, the, the logically and rationally nonsense questions, which are what really matter to us as human beings. What is love? Is there a God? Uh, what happens when I die? Uh, why was I born? These, these are questions that are incredibly important to us as human beings. They, uh, they, but attempts to reduce them down to knowable, verifiable propositions are always going to fail. And every cult deals with that in one way or another. And the fifth bit is, is that within every cult there is some sort of a scheme that can be boiled down to as above, so below. The world is, the world that we interact with in some way reflects whatever our, our divine or infernal hierarchy is. I thought that there was some pretty good things to put in this cult, uh, guidelines. So, and so if you're making a cult for a role playing game or whatever, and you're thinking about this, if you make a cult and you see this so often in fantasy, and you see this so often in gaming, oh, okay, well, this is the, the, the cult here, the members of the cult, but they're, they're really interested in this power. They're, they're, they're really interested in power. They don't have, well, Things that are nothing but a naked power grab are a naked power grab and don't tend to be very long successful religious movements. Things that, and, and also they become very flawed for you to interact with them in the game. It, it basically is a transparent filming. Whereas you, you start asking, well, what do these people think about these five, uh, five, five things? And yeah, part of this could be a naked power grab but they also believe a lot of other complex things around it. It makes them more interesting characters to, or, or groups to interact with. Well, and some of that too is, you know, for example, why Cults of Cracks, one of the first uh, RuneQuest books to really just like decisively lay out, this is the setting, and this, this is how the, the uh, theological, you know, mythical universe works. That was revolutionary at the time because it tried to answer those questions for the cults, whereas a lot of other fantasy role playing games. Oh, yeah, the Yetis and Yemeni guys as well. How many good points does this but, guy have? But even, even so, you know, stepping back from just the mechanical aspect, there wasn't a lot of thought about, like, if I worship the Celtic pantheon, what does that mean? You know, what do I believe? It was just generally a list of super powerful characters, you know, it was the, like the Justice League, or, um, you know, you go, okay, here's the Norse pantheon, here's the Greek pantheon, here's the Celtic pantheon, look at them, they're an amazing array of interesting personalities, and I, but, and but I there's nothing about the actual, like, what is their faith like, how do they believe, what happens to you after you die, how do you relate to each other, and none of that was in there, whereas Cult of Cracks was the, no, this matters. I don't know if that was you know, one of the things that hooked me about for a reason. Yeah, it's how does my, and it, it focused on the stuff as how does my player character or how do the characters in this game interact with, with uh, these entities. And, you know, one thing in mythology, you're not usually running around and, you know, joking about running up and going, well, you know, I think it's time for me to go and kill, um, uh, kill Thor. Uh, you know, that's just not how, you know, really 
personally relevant. But what is important is, is that if I worship Thor, what do I get for it? What does Thor do for me? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to disagree with uh, part of your perspective on cults because I come at it from an anthropological view as opposed to philosophical, philosophical. Uh, but on mythology, um, one of the things that I've noticed, especially with Pendragon, what about the evolution and the absorption of other myths? Because Pendragon itself, when you're starting, you have Jeffrey of Monmouth starting off with the house, but then you have Parsifal from Eschenbach from Germany, you have Roland <coughs> of France, you have Shreti and Detroit from Lancelot. These are all being pulled together into one evolved mega mythology. A monomyth. Right. By um, Mallory. So how do you address this? Because you're talking about the absorption of multiple myths of iconic characters, heroic figures from different cultures. Same thing happened in Mesoamerica with the absorption of many of the deities of the Mayans into the uh, Toltec and Mixtec myths. So. Yeah, well, and, and that's really what Grave did, and to your question as well, um, is synthesizing, uh, and you stopped with Mallory, but uh, I mean, the, the Pendragon monomyth includes everything up through and beyond myths of Avalon. I mean, you know, Grave was a hippie, so he wanted some like neo-pagan stuff in there, and he wanted some empowered, you know, women characters in there as well. well yeah, but I didn't want to pull in Camelot 3000 either. Right, yeah, exactly. So. Um, so, so Mallory is the core of the monomyth, uh, but it, it, you know, Greg's creation is pretty much unique, I think, in Arthurian scholarship in that it integrates um, everything from Jeffrey of Monmouth all the way up through 20th and 21st century literature um, in a way that makes sense, you know. Uh, you, obviously, yeah, you do have to have a sort of a central core narrative, which is where Mallory comes in, but then um, pulls in these other influences as well uh, in a way that um, makes them all work together. I mean, that's why you, you do have paganism as, a, as a, uh, an option for your character. And it's important to keep, I mean, one of the things that, that to me is always important and from a game design perspective is that the Pentagon monument is not intended to be an objective historical analysis. No, it's, it's, not not it's not supposed to be scholarship. No. It is, to cre it is creating a new myth that incorporates as many different other stories as Greg was able to work together into a, uh, as David said, the narrative based on Mallory. And it's the same thing in, in, in Gorinka as well. It, when we, we, we talk about how uh, you know, the Mayan and Mesoamerican, or Mayan and Aztec religions influenced each other in Mesoamerica, in Glorantha, the question would be, well, aren't those the same gods? It's not that they influence on each other. You have the same set of archetypes, and you have two different groups of cultures interacting with the same same archetype. Yes, but I'm talking about it in the context of a role-playing game. I, I hear I'm not you. talking about it in the context of, of the real-world way that we study mythology as an anthropological exercise. I'm talking about it. They parallel with each other and they intersect with each other, but it's very important not to go very far down that because then what we do is we we, we start trying to figure out well, what's the real story, what what is this proper, you know, what is the real truth here. But that's not the exercise we have here. The exercise in a role playing game in in, in a fictional setting is we're creating a fictionalized way that we can participate and experience in this. And it's a really important thing, because I fall down that path all the time. And whenever I do it, I hope that Jason or David, uh, you know, kicks me in the head with a hammer. Because it's, it's correct, and it's, it's, it's proper scholarship, but that's not actually what we're doing here. We're creating something that is a participatory thing. Well, and, and Greg would go down that path with, with medieval history with Pendragon. Oh, I found this amazing book on 12th century Norman property law. Yes. Uh, hey, like, Jeff, do you have some more follow up on that? Like, Greg, in what context <laughs> is 12th, 12th century medieval Norman property law going to be pertinent to what we're doing in the game? It's fascinating, maybe. 
It's right. asking us about pay, it's cool, it's great, but how is that pertinent? At the risk of being an editor, I think our time is up, and we should probably put a period at the end of this uh, article and allow our- I hope it was interesting for-